Thank you so much for coming. This is part two of tackling controversial topics. Uh, it's now the evangelist and the academics. That's great. Um, and for all the evan evangelists who have been thinking through this stuff with us two days ago, so already quite a long time ago, I'm just going to give a very, very brief summary. Academics, you've just had a bear with me. Um, so what we have been talking about in our first session was mainly thinking about, okay, so people have this opinion that is quite different to our opinion. What is the good aim behind this? Assuming that people don't have bad morals, they have actually have good morals. So why do they want what they want? Why do they advocate for abortion? Why do they advocate for um, relativism, for all these things? And what is the good aim behind this? And then thinking about what can we learn from this? Where does that put a mirror, so to say, in front of us? And what have we done wrong? Where do we need to maybe apologize? What do we, yeah, what can we take from this in our own practice and our own, own walk with Jesus? And then the third question was, okay, if we know about this good aim, that is possibly a gospel issue, what is the best way towards this? So how can we talk about the gospel in a way that, the truth, the power, but especially the beauty of the gospel stands out. People were sit there thinking, oh, if that is the case, then I really want it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what we've been thinking about. Any further question that has come up from this? All right, great. Then we're just going to dig into part two, which is going to be way more practical. So be prepared to get together and discuss for yourself but before we do that I think Jose is going to share a few more things about what that can mean practically yeah. hi guys pleasure to be here again so Julia was, was saying yesterday many, many times Christianity and the message of Jesus is a very story, and, and it is, and, and we we know. And, and it was interesting with with the academics, the idea of so how how do we draw the line between the things that we need to say, the, the truth. The I love to say sometimes when I'm in in a public setting, even out loud, um, you might think otherwise. You might think that Christianity is a message against certain things. However, Christianity is a very story in everything. So when we when we think about uh, how how can we uh, do the differentiation between the essential things, the not essential things. So we asked in the session before, no? how, how do we draw the line? No? How, how do we know if someone asks about sexuality, if we have to say this is forbidden uh, or this is a sin? Or how, 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 how do we know where to draw a line between essentials and not essentials? One important thing that we need to, to know is that we are talking about evangelism. So we, so if we are talking about theology, we, we might have a pff, great discussion about what is essential, what is not essential. But we are talking about evangelism. So another way for me to make this differentiation between essentials and not essentials is the question of evangelism and discipleship. That's a good way, at least for for me, to do it. So I ask myself sometimes, Josué, is this opinion, this phrase, this statement? essential or not essential for the evangelistic proclamation. In other words, is this part of the evangelistic message or is it part of the discipleship? That's a, a, a good question that I want to leave you to think about a little bit. So when, when, when someone asks, so for example, in the debate that, that, that we had, uh, the atheist uh, YouTuber sees um, bisexual and sees having uh, yeah an open relationship uh, with uh, different people. And she asked a very interesting question in the debate. She said, 
What does the Christian God has to offer to a bisexual woman like me? Love it. I love the question. What does the Christian... Uh, and Julia was saying something. Uh, it's not about the truth. It's about what, what, what do I gain? What, what that has to offer to me? So uh, let me tell you three things that I uh, think are really important ones that we try to, to, do, to do that. First of all, value the, the risk. All of that, do it in advance. It might be worth asking yourself, so which doors am I closing? Am I putting some barriers? Am I putting myself, my ministry, my proclamation in danger? So I, I'm, I'm not saying with that, don't, don't take risk. I'm not saying this. I'm saying before taking risk, think about the risk that you're taking. So, yeah, I, I'll tell you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm going to, to ask Julia because it's interesting that some conversation that we, we were having also in our country. So value the risk. For, for example, in European countries, like maybe Spain, Germany, and some... If, if you if you say certain things uh, around sexuality, it might mean closed doors in universities. I'm not saying don't say anything. I'm saying understand, acknowledge that certain things that you say might mean you're not welcome here anymore. Uh, tell us a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. So basically, um, sorry. Can we just take this off? So basically, in Germany, um, the context where I'm mostly working in, um, the Christian unions who often invite us, um, they can have, mostly have a status, status of being an acknowledged university group, and then that gives them the chance to book lecture halls for free. So it's a very important thing to have. Now... If I was to say something in public, for example, against homosexuals, that might very easily mean that I will not be invited into university again to talk about Jesus and that that Christian union that invited me will be shut off from university. We had, have had cases like that. So that's what Jose means when I say, when he says, value the risk. And for me then, or for us as a team, the question was, is that worth it? We are evangelists. We want to talk about primarily about the love of Jesus. I'm not a moral, like I'm not an ethical teacher. I'm not very much knowledgeable about the whole issue of transgender and, and, and all of that. So as a team... And I've actually talked to John Lennox about that, and he's got this, the same stand as, as I have, the same opinion. As a team, we have decided, when we get asked the question of homosexuality, here is the way how I deal with this. I firstly say, I know that there are people here who might have been harmed by Christians, who've been rejected on the basis of your sexual identity. If that's the case for you, I'm very, very sorry. Can I please apologize? I, I don't think this is how Jesus would react to, the pers to a person. He loves each and every one of you. And that's the primary message of the Christian faith. You are deeply, deeply loved. Now, sometimes I would add, um, the interesting thing about Jesus is that he invites us to put the full weight of our identity on him and him alone. And that is a, a challenge for all of us, for each one of us, because we put our identity on so many different things, but Jesus invites us to put his identity on himself. But also, this whole issue of, of sexuality is a very personal issue. So, whoever asked that question, sometimes they're texted in anonymous, I don't know, but when I see the person, I, I, I address them directly and say, why don't you come and see me afterwards and we discuss, can discuss this further? Now, I have had various cases of people who did come to me afterwards, and it ended up to be 
a, a long pastoral conversation. I had one student who said to me afterwards, who came and said to me, I'm the one, I'm gay. I was always a brilliant student. I've come to university, I'm studying mathematics, I'm failing. All my exams so far, I failed. I have realized I need a new basis of my identity. That's why I'm here. I want to, want to check whether Christianity is a good basis for my identity. But I also wanted to know, because I'm gay, would you accept, accept me? Because if you shut the door before me, I don't have to look here. I don't even have to start looking. And, and I can go and search somewhere else. And I was standing there, and I really got goosebumps and thought, you know, had I just said, yeah, you know, homosexuality is just fully not on with Jesus, this guy would have walked out of the room, never considered Jesus again. But because we were then able to have a personal conversation, I was actually able to pray with him at the end of this. He didn't directly give his life to Jesus, but in a postmodern context, you can offer people should I pray with you? It's all about experience. <laughs> and it, it did set him on a walk with Jesus. And I trust that Jesus will lead him. Is this a discipleship issue? My friend David Bennett, when he became a Christian from being a gay activist, he thought, okay, now uh, he was so convinced of the love of Jesus that he said, oh, now I've got to join this silly Christian club. He did, and then he thought, okay, now maybe then I've got to get married to a gay person. It's all about gay marriage. And then it was years later that he, he actually thought, oh, no, I think what the Bible is teaching me is to become celibate. It was a long walk for him. So let's trust Jesus and let's trust the church that we will take them on a walk. But it's not a walk that they can do in one minute. This is a deep issue. So value the risk and think about what is essential and what's non-essential and think about what are the doors that you might close with a very quick and hard answer. Again, we're not saying, you know, just <laughs> don't talk about the truth, but the question is how do you do this? I wanted Julia to, to yeah, to show us... Um, kind of the process that the German team uh, yeah, yeah, get through in, in order to, to um, realize how, how do we as a team, in the case of Germany, deal with, with this question. As, as we said two days ago, we, 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 this, this way that they are dealing, it might not be the perfect way. They might be wrong. There might be a, a, a better way of dealing with it. They might, in, in, in five years, they, they might say, okay, we, we should do it in a different way. The, the interesting thing is that the risk that we are um, trying to, to, to value here might, might vary a lot from context to context, from country to country. For sure, the abortion issue is a big deal in, in yeah, certain countries like Spain, Germany, but, but probably not in Poland. Maybe not in Hungary, for sure not in Russia. So maybe the, the transgender thing in 10 years is not a big deal in Spain. So just acknowledge that and, and say, okay. Um, second thing that, that, I, that I, will, I will encourage you in order to, to know um, is uh, choose your, your battles. Um, it's an important question. What battles are worth fighting? What battles are worth fighting? Because you, my friend, you cannot, you cannot fight everything. That's a lie that the society tells us. We cannot fight everything. You cannot be an activist of everything. <laughs> you can't. And, and mostly, if, if you are in a panel or in a television program or in, in a debate, whatever, you don't have all the time that you might want to have. If they ask you a question, like, what does the, 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 the Christian God has to offer for me? You don't have one hour. 
You have two minutes. What, what, what battles are you going to fight? If you are in, in a public debate talking about sexuality, you cannot fight everything. So what, 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 what are the battles that you say, oh, I need to fight for that for sure? If you get one shot, one opportunity, as Eminem used to say, what, what do you say? Really, if you have one shot, what do you say? If they ask you a, a question about transsexuality, you have one shot, one minute, what is the most essential thing as an evangelist, not as a theologian, not as, a, um, what, as an evangelist, what is the most essential, if, one shot, because we, we, we sometimes have only one shot. I share with you my personal mantra. Um, I'm not trying to, to, to tell you to do my, your own, but my personal mantra is this, Josue Moreno, you are, I am an evangelist, not a moralist or a, the or a politician. It helps me to establish uh, red lines and priorities. Uh, first of all, because I love discussing things, whatever the topic, and I love political issues a lot. I read, I love, I, I sympathize with some views, I, discuss, I, I don't really like other views. So I, I, I might have the danger to, yeah, to fight things that I don't want to fight, to begin discussions that, that I don't want to discuss. I don't want to, to waste my time discussing if socialism is good enough for society. If we are talking about it, Jesus, I want to discuss that. I don't want to waste half an hour discussing fine tuning. It's great fine tuning. But I don't want to waste half an hour. I prefer to discuss half an hour discussing if Jesus is worth it, if it's good trying, if it's good for your life. So um, if we are evangelists, please be focused on Jesus. And once you, you, you have your shot, your opportunity, um, be focused on, on that. So l let me tell you about also about the, uh, something ab about my, my own process. I, I, I knew before the debate with this uh, atheist that she is very uh, LGBT um, uh, activist. So, I knew that she was going to ask something about that. I didn't know that she was going to do such a great question that I, I love in the way that, that she even framed the question. So what does the Christian God has to offer for me? It's really, really nice. It's also, yeah. The thing that I really want to say to her that I, that I did is God is here for you. Right now. Because the Christian message that is in the Bible from top to top, is a God who came to you where you are, not where you should be, where you are. And from there, he's going to work for you in your redemption. From when you are, from where you are, he's going to bring you to redemption. I don't care where you are. I don't care what you love. God loves you and God is here for you. And I tell her directly, he's ready. Are you ready? God is ready here. He's here for you, ready. But because he loves you, see, he's not going to leave you where you are. He's going to, he's going to bring you to redemption. And that's for me, is the essential thing in, in, in the topic of uh, sexuality. Yeah, he wants you, he wants you. Yeah, very nice. I, I would probably do the same thing. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to answer that, that question. With, uh, uh, so first of all, I, I'm not, I, I don't like closed questions at all in my life. Yeah, but if, if, if they ask, ask, ask me that in the, in the debate, I will try to, um, yeah, nicely, uh, with a joke or something, try to move a little bit of a um, better question and say the same. You know, Rocio, God is for you. God loves you. 
and he wants to, uh, yeah, he's ready for you. It's an opportunity for you here right now. I don't know. I don't know what, what some people tell you about Christianity. I don't know what you, what, what you face with some Christians. The guy loves you and he wants to be with you. He wants to know you. Do you want to know him? Yeah. I'm because I, I want I want to to yeah focus the debate on on her experience on her life and on Jesus. So I I, I didn't want the, the debate to to be focused on the ethical issues that I think are very very much important thing, but they are disciples. So you, you don't believe, the, the, you don't care about the Bible. If you're an atheist, you don't care about the Bible. I'm telling you to not be an atheist. So let's begin with that. We will deal with the, with the ethical issues later. So I think um, I would be cautious to, for example, if this is, is what you just said, if this is obviously a talk about um, fine-tuning, then please answer all the questions about fine-tuning. <laughs> so so don't, uh, don't, don't misunderstand Jose as if uh, whatever they say, your answer is Jesus loves you. Please don't do that. Please don't go away. Uh, <laughs> that's definitely not what we want to do. And... Um, I think when you, when I was, if I was asked the question, do you think homosexuality is a sin? Um, I would first think, say, okay, so what is a sin? Because most people in my culture think sin is either murder or the piece of cake that I've eaten, even though I was on a diet. In both cases, Jesus is not really going to help me. I'm not going to get, well, or whatever. Um, and then I say, so what, how I understand sin is that there seems to be a fundamental um, problem in relationship. So we've got, as, a, as human beings, we've got relationship to ourselves, we've got relationship to other people, we've got a relationship to nature, to this earth, very much aware of that, climate change. And I believe, because I'm a Christian, we also made for a vertical relationship to God. And I think all these relationships are in disorder. And I think we're seeing that all over the world. And most people go like, yeah, yeah. And I think, and then I say, so the outcome of this is I hurt others, guilt. Others hurt me. I'm wounded. And I feel shame. And there's entanglement. So I live in a society that lives at the expense of others. I'm born in this, into this world. I can't help it. I will damage other people. I'm trying to buy fair trade clothes, but my phone, I don't know how many slaves have worked for it. That's entanglement. And I think when the Bible talks about sin, this, it, it encompasses all of this. And I think all of us have experienced these things. We've, we all heard, we heard others. We experience shame. We're entangled. And, um, and I think Jesus comes into this world to restore relationships and then to deal with, with all these issues. And I think there's no one in this world who is a sexual human being, and most of us are, who has not been hurt in one way or the other, or who hasn't hurt others in one way or the other, where there's no sort of disorder in some of our you know, experiences of sexuality. So I think this is something that is relevant for all of us. And I think Jesus comes to redeem this. So that's how I would go about the question. See, I am sort of dodging the question a little bit, but I'm also hoping to give some answers and to broaden the view a little bit. Yeah. Alex, did you have a question or something to say? But I, I, I'll try to be very careful because um, I, I, I don't really live in Europe in the sense that in, in, a, uh, in, in this kind of environment where you really need to be uh, very, very politically correct. So, because I am 45, so I have some age, 
And I've come from a communist country, so I've been completely shut down and never been free to say, not even believe that God, I should, I am free to believe. Uh, what I see now in Europe and in this such a context where you have to be so careful, but so careful that I can hardly see where is the truth of the gospel. So I really love this example because it, 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 it really touches my, the, the, the sorrow of my heart that when we are speaking the truth in love, I think we're forgetting to speaking the truth. Because the truth is there. I was just reading, I was just thinking about that. Jesus said, go, sin no more. I mean, he gave a, a concrete example. And also with Zacchaeus, like a terrible tax collector. He said he went, he, like, for some reason he understood that he did something wrong because he did something so amazing. Uh, but Jesus told them the truth. I mean, are we, and that's my worry, it's really a worry, uh, are, we, are we accepting the culture? Are we being trapped in this cultural that we can, we can hardly speak the truth of the gospel? And to be honest, I, I don't want to accept this. Yeah. I love people, but I'm going to tell them the truth of the gospel, no matter what. And they're going to they're gonna hate me, they're going to bigot me, or whatever. I don't care. I'm not here to be loved by homosexual, by feminist, by nobody. I'm here to speak the truth of the gospel in love, uh, but yet speak it. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you. And I think I would very much agree with a lot of what you said. We very interesting see Jesus not condemning the woman caught in adultery. By the way, where's the man caught in adultery? But he doesn't, does not also, it also doesn't condone. So he doesn't say it's all okay. And that's very important. Interestingly, you brought up the example of Zacchaeus. Jesus is not reported to have said anything towards Zacchaeus. It was the grace of Jesus coming to his home that seems to have made him repent and do all these things. But that's interestingly an example for Jesus not really saying anything, maybe also because it was so clear for Zacchaeus that what he was doing was, yeah, <laughs> what was not really on. So um, I think, sorry, what we really didn't want to say is just go about and say Jesus loves you and everything is going to be fine anyway. As Jose said, I think it is important to think about the implications. So, as I said, we as a team made this decision of not going into the details of homosexuality. And I think we did this for good reasons. Again, I, I talked to John Lennox um, a few weeks ago about this, and he said he's absolutely backing that. He does that too, just because it would close so many doors. But then obviously when the person comes to me in person, I, I can be more free. Um, and then what, also what we're not saying is speak the truth. I agree with you, speak the truth and love. But I think we do have to find out how can people hear it in a loving way. And I think that is so important. Because for example, in my cu culture, if I say for, to a homosexual, yeah, God loves... God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. They don't understand that as being something that is loving. And that is because, again, this is so much tangled up with identity, that there's not the differentiation between the sinner and the sin. It's all, it's all me. So I think, again, I'm speaking the truth in love, but actually I'm not, so I need to find other words I need to voice things in a different way. This is why we made this exercise. So I'm all for speaking the truth, but how do we speak the truth? Because truth and love cannot be separated. When you look at Jesus, it's always love and truth go together. We've sadly made this distinction between the two. It's an interesting one. Uh, so we, I think what we were trying to say is really let's try and think about how can we find new ways of expressing the truth, the beauty, and the power of the gospel. So not to shy away from it, but so that people actually really understand it. Because also, words are so puffed up in our context, and they often mean a very different thing. 
So if, my, if I say to my mom, you are a sinner, what she understands is, uh, uh, sorry, if I say to my mom, you're not a Christian, she understands I'm a very bad person. That, that's not what I'm saying. But this is her understanding. So, and, and I think we are in somehow, some ways responsible for, you know, as an evangelist, to find out how can we find words. Um, I'm very conscious of the time. We did want to do an exercise. But there were, I think, two questions here. Yes, please. Yeah, just on the topic of how to present things, I think that it's important not to leave out the Holy Spirit out of the equation. And by that, I mean 2 Corinthians 4, for example, where Paul says that we speak the truth and we just lay it out there, and then it's up to everybody's conscience to how they understand it. So we need to be mindful also that God works through His Word. The Holy Spirit is there and works through His Word. So we should, I think, be careful in making too many calculations as to what will, because you mentioned risk before, yes, there may be risk, but you also don't know how God will deal with that risk. So let's not be too intellectual about what that risk will be and assume that it's going, that A is going to lead to B. And I'll give two examples. For me, for example, I was working in an environment where I was not, definitely not supposed to be sharing the gospel and I was doing it and it just went completely under the radar. Completely under. So things you can do that sometimes. So you you shouldn't assume that your your organization is going to get shut down just because you're doing it. The other thing is Jesus was in an in a politically very politically tenuous environment, and and that is exactly why the the leaders of the the Jews were were afraid of him because they're like this guy's messing up the very tenacious situation we're in, and of course he knew that, but he was still talking. And so I think we should really take our cue from that as well and not, not go too far in our own human way of planning, but really also trust the Holy Spirit when we can speak and when not, because speaking the truth in love and what you said is extremely important, especially in Europe, the way we are now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you to that. I think you wanted to say something. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to push back a little bit on the Lazarus thing. That you just, sorry, not Lazarus. Zacchaeus, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I think it's unthinkable that if they spent a couple of hours together having a meal in Zacchaeus's home, that Jesus wouldn't have had a conversation with him. I know you didn't say he didn't, but you suggested at least that his words may not have had the impact. Um, you know, we do know that Jesus did preach the uh, arrival of the kingdom of God, repent and believe the good news. So I think it's unthinkable that he wouldn't have said that at least to Zacchaeus during the time. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just said we haven't that in report, but yeah, he might have. All right, thank Yeah, so um, just I'm very conscious we could obviously go on in this discussion, but um, I did want to give you some time to maybe develop your own answer. Maybe everything we've said is rubbish, and please forget about it. But um, maybe... You know, these are some of the, the topics that we've been collecting that you have identified as difficult topics. So maybe you want to get into groups of two or three and choose one of those topics and think about, maybe we only, you only have time for one or two, think about some of these questions. Why is this an issue? What are the challenges in my culture, in my context? What is the good aim behind the general general secular opinion, so to say, and how can the gospel be a better story towards this aim? So what do we need to say? Why is the gospel so good? Why is it powerful? Why is it true? Why is it true? And then how would you answer the question if you were asked it after a talk? So um, we've got another, I think, 20 minutes. So why don't you get together in pairs of two and three and discuss this among yourself. Pick one of those topics, or if you have a completely different one, then go for that one. Our time is coming to a close and food is waiting. I would have very much loved to hear <laughs> uh, all the ideas and thoughts you came up with. But um, as we said, this is, this is the process. We were hoping to give you some principles and for you to apply them in your own context, that might be really different to other contexts. And um, I'd very much love to go around and hear <laughs> what you made of, you know, how the gospel can be good news in, in the question that you were tackling. Um, so do feel free to, to be chatting for the rest of the conference about this. Um, I think Jose just wanted to add one more thing. Yes, th thank you for all the interaction. Yes, uh, 
would come into my, my mind uh, to uh, moments in Jesus' uh, life when people ask uh, Jesus, so, so should we give money to Caesar or not? And then he didn't answer yes or not. Um, when, Cis, when Pilatus says, are you the king? He didn't answer. So just just to to yeah to say in that so we I, I I didn't want to give you uh rules we just try to start the conversation and the dialogue between principles that help us to think of course uh I don't want you to uh not talking about socialism or uh, about topics I just want you to think if I I have to say some things, what priorities, what, what things I don't want to leave the room without saying. I'm not saying not, don't talk about other things, I'm saying what things I don't want to, to leave the room without saying. And it's interesting, so why in the case of Jesus, for example, he didn't answer the questions. It's, it's interesting because he, he cares about the person, he cares about truth, he cares, he loves the people that ask the question. He loves the people till death. But he didn't answer the question. And he loves the people, and he valued the people, and he valued reasons and everything. He did that. Yes, that. And so thank you. And sorry if I didn't explain properly, or if I'm maybe. So, sorry, yeah, just one thing. From, from the first day, I said something that I want to repeat. I, I might be wrong in the way that I'm processing and thinking things. And you know what? You might be wrong too. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, the, 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 the point, the point that sometimes we, we, we think that people might be wrong, but we, for, we forget that we might be wrong. And in those controversial topics and how we tackle, how we deal with it, it's really difficult. There is not a simple, we want a simple answer to how to deal with it, but there is no simple answer. And you might be wrong in the way that you're dealing. And I might be wrong in the way I'm dealing. So just, yeah, I think we, 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 we need humility in the way that we, we see. So we, we want to present Jesus to people. We want to help people to come to Jesus. And we don't really know how to do it. And that's, yeah, I think we, it's good that we remember that we, we don't really know. So you then <laughs> I was at a university in um in Denmark a few years ago and um there was one girl student who'd come back every night and uh the last before the last evening I got talking to her and I said to her, What what do you make of all of this? And she said, If this is true, it's the most beautiful story I've ever heard in my whole life. Now I need to find out whether it's true. And I thought, oh, this is such a postmodern way of doing it. <laughs> but isn't that great? Someone has presented the gospel, I think it was actually my clots, um, in a way that she thinks, oh, this is so beautiful. Now I need to find out whether it's true. Truth and love and beauty and power of the gospel, they all matter. So let's go out and present them in a way that is compelling uh, to, to other people. Let's pray.